Well, welcome everyone. I am so glad that you came to join us in our session on leading multi-campus staff teams. I'm not sure if you came here for this session or just taking a break from the heat to make it to the other ones, uh, but man, glad that you are here. We're going to jump right in. Uh, both Todd and I have got a brief presentation, and then we really want to focus in on some of the things that you guys want to hear, so some questions uh, for us. So first question is, why reach the city. Why reach the city? Um, both Todd and I are lovers of the city. Um, uh, in Jonah, you hear um, God speaking to his prophet. He says, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. And a lot of us say, okay, well, that's where uh, uh, Jonah was supposed to go. He never, he makes it there reluctantly, but he kind of takes a little circuitous route. And so we ask that question, why Nineveh? Why Nineveh? Well, a lot of you guys know that Nineveh was the capital of Assyria and the most important city in that day and time. God didn't just want to speak to the folks in that city, massive city as it was. He wanted to change the world through this culture leading city. We serve a strategic God. We serve a strategic God. He has always called his people to be influential. You see in Jonah, he's called to Nineveh. Jeremiah shares God's heart for his people to influence Babylon in their exile. He says, go build houses and prosper that city because God wanted to change the culture around them. Uh, Jerusalem uh, is where the church um, explodes. Um, and then what we see today is that cities have not just regional impact, but global impact, global impact. Cities like Boston, cities like New York, cities like Chicago touch all over the world. And so we have to ask that question. If we want global impact, should we not reach the city? But then we ask, how do we reach the city? What influences those global impacting regions? Well, I believe it's the college campuses in them. That's where those leaders are rising up. That's where they're getting their um, understanding of the world. And if we reach those college campuses, we literally will change the world. 27% of U.S. college students now attend school in the nation's 10 largest cities. Uh, I'll say it again. 27% of U.S. college students now attend school in the nation's 10 largest cities. Um, my friend Todd uh, ministers in Chicago, 500,000 college students in Chicago alone. And you guys uh, can share your stats of your cities. Um, uh, also, what we see is um, many students now are trying to save some cash, right? And you guys know that even your state school's uh, tuition rates are going through the roof. Um, and so what are they doing? They are attending community colleges uh, to try to um, save a few dollars. Maybe they're living at home. And one of the things that we're seeing as we begin reaching out in some of the community colleges around the city of Richmond is that we have an opportunity to reach them even before they hit our main campuses. And as we reach out in multi-site, um, as a multi-site uh, ministry in Richmond, we are beginning beginning to influence them so they can be leaders when they come to our campus for their two years um, there. I wanted to share um, real quick our stories about how we uh, came into this process of leading uh, multi-site team. So um, when I finished up my internship with my internship director right over here, Steve Lehman, uh, at Eastern uh, Michigan University, uh, we, were, we were looking for a place of influence, and we felt like God was calling us back to the Northeast. Um, and so we ended up joining a team that formed miraculously in Washington, D.C. in 1999. Uh, we saw 13 different missionaries coming together for, for really a God moment. Uh, my friend Mark Hoffman is the back, was part of that uh, initial team. And so we gathered together, and, man, we were 
uh, in awe of really what God was doing at that time. And um, we, uh, many of us were brand new. Mark was kind of showing us around uh, the D.C. area. He had been there for a couple of years, but we had no idea literally what we were doing. I carried around, this was before GPS, right? I carried around this laminated map of the city, um, and I was constantly trying to flip that open, figuring out where I was going. One of the problems about D.C. is if you take a wrong turn, you will end up in the next state. It just happens that way. Um, and so we were learning the city together. We were relying on each other in relationship, and we were pioneering the city together. We were in each other's homes. We were praying together. Um, we just believed that what God was going to do, and it was an exciting time for us. Uh, there wasn't a lot going on in other cities at that time, and we were beginning that process. And so God started doing some amazing things, and our groups began to grow. We saw our group. We were pioneering at American University. We saw our groups grow from a handful of students in uh, the obscure uh, athletic uh, department building where no one could get to. Literally, we put up like 13 signs to help students get to where they needed to go. Uh, it grew from about four or five students to that next semester. We had 12. We grew. We doubled in size after that. We doubled in size after that. And so we saw a significant number of students gathering together. But one of the things that we also found is that our ministries on campus started to grow. And as we focused in more and more on what God was doing on our separate universities, one of the things that was difficult about that time is that that camaraderie, that connection, that relationship we had as we were pioneering the city together began to fracture. And our success on campus began to separate what had been a very tight-knit community. And so it began to be more of a struggle. And it's our success kind of became that very thing that caused our, uh, our, our multi-site team to become more and more difficult to grow. And so one of the things that we wanted to share with you is from our experience, just a few things about what can make your multi-site, whether you are ready to launch or you're thinking about it or you're in the middle of it, become more effective. And so that's a little bit of my story. I wanted to have Todd come and share a little bit about his story too. Thanks, Mike. Um, hey, thank you guys for coming once again. We really appreciate you guys being here. We trust no matter where you're at on your journey, whether you're reaching a city or going to an urban center or you're just in if you will, a traditional smaller town, but you're doing multi-site. We believe that there's going to be some things here, some nuggets of wisdom um, that Lord willing would be able to help you. As Mike shared, my name is Todd, and um, I do ministry in the city of Chicago. I'm from Chicago, born and raised on the city's north side, but I did not go to school in Chicago. I attended school in Southern Illinois um, at Southern Illinois University. I had a phenomenal experience. That's where I got saved. I gave my heart to Jesus as a friend. Freshman, got involved with Chi Alpha over a year later, um, got discipled the whole nine, felt God's call to ministry um, in undergrad, didn't pursue ministry until about a year after graduating with my degree in marketing. Went back to Carbondale, studied um, as an intern, stayed on staff um, until, uh, what was it, 2009. And the Lord spoke to me in 2009, hey, there is no Chi Alpha in Chicago. And we know when God says that he's not just giving information, you know, it was like hint, hint. And so um, I spoke to my leaders. I spoke to Pastor Dale Crawl. I spoke to Steve Lehman, spoke to Bob Marks. And they all said, hey, we believe this is God's time. We believe that um, Chicago's the place. And we believe that God wants you to go and pioneer this. And so I went to Chicago in 2009. Didn't know a soul as it pertained to students on campus or administrators and started from scratch. Um, itinerated in the churches, connected with students from that, those churches, um, administrators from those churches, and we started at UIC in 2010. Leaving a lot out, obviously, but in 2010, we launched at the University of Illinois at Chicago, 25,000 students in the heart of the city of Chicago. And the Lord spoke to me um, early on that it was going to be a multi-campus thing. Well, here's the deal. It's hard to do multi-campus with one person. <laughs> and so I would say my, my first mistake of many was going alone. And, um, and it, was, it was a beautiful launch, and God blessed it. But in hindsight, if we had a team, 
what would the Lord have done? Well, in spite of our limited staff, myself and a handful of volunteers, um, in 2010, God opened up doors, not just at UIC, I'm sorry, in 2011, a year later, not just at UIC, but at Loyola University, as well as St. Xavier University. From there, um, two years later, Northwestern came into the fold and Columbia College. All along, it's myself and some volunteers. Yeah, I know there's a lot that I'm leaving out. It does not make sense. It didn't make sense. It was insane. So there were sparks that were really being lit on these different campuses. The students were engaged. They were excited. But without staff and team, you can only go so deep. And you guys understand that. Well, in 2014, four years into it, my staff doubled. I got married. Okay. And so... Um, in that year, we had two of our former students come on as MAs. Fast forward to today, we now have 10 staffers, including, um, that's not including about five hardcore volunteers. We'll talk about volunteering here in a moment. But we have about 15 on our team. 10 of them are full-time staffers reaching five campuses, and we're still understaffed. But um, we have a passion for reaching the cities, specifically for us, Chicago. And I'll talk a little bit more about my journey and some things that we have learned through that process and what we are doing now. Uh, but it's a beautiful mission to reach these urban centers in multiple campuses, which I believe is actually the trend right now for not just Chi Alpha, but for other urban um, or for other campus ministries. So I'll turn it back over to Mike. Thanks, Todd. We we really do believe um, in team, um, and we believe that that team comes together in relationship. You guys, we are committed in a relational ministry, right? We believe for for students. We preach it over and over and over again. But one of the things that I found as I get older in this ministry is that many times in my life I have preached about relationship. I've encouraged relationship. But then when I take a look around at the relationship and in my life, it's lacking. Uh, we become, um, you know, preachers, we become like purveyors of relationship, but we don't see it in our lives. And so I want to encourage you. Um, and a lot of times this, this can be that frustrating thing. You're like, I, I need staff. I need to grow staff, especially in these hard places of the cities. You're like, oh, we need to grow staff. Uh, and we're constantly looking for somebody to fill a position. Uh, and can I just tell you this is that it just, it doesn't happen. I mean, you can post a notice up on the Kai Alpha website and pray for somebody to come, but the way that you're able to develop that team is is, is growing that team through relationship. And so I want to encourage you as we talk about being uh, disciplers and what Eli shared today is so, so, so important. You can't be, actually, I think with Scott was sharing this, you can't be a discipler unless you're a disciple yourself. And we can't be a disciple unless we walk in community. And so I want to encourage you as you begin to dream about or as you are actively engaging in leading a multi-site team, relationship and community is of utmost importance. And so we ask that question, how do we cultivate um, relationship? I already talked about this um, uh, Committing to being a relational ministry. I think one of the things that's so important, you guys know this, but I need to reiterate this. Quantity time is vital in developing a quality relationship. We were reminded of this again as Eli was talking about how do you develop disciples. It's not in a meeting. It's not sitting around a table, a conference table. It's not um, just that main weekly meeting or that that session you have teaching about how you know, you're going to develop those team dynamics it's being in each other's homes it's sharing meals it's it's watching each other's kids uh it's going on vacation together it is that quantity time that develops trust and a quality relationship it is essential to trust each other when we begin to engage leading on multi-site teams primarily because as that distance grows the chance or the, i mean it just it just gets more complicated and the chance of frustration grows with that. And so um, we need to commit to being a relational ministry. How do we do that? A couple of ways. One are through staff, days, and retreats. When we first began 
our team in um, uh, in Washington, D.C., we, we went on a retreat. We called ourselves the Harper's Ferry 13. You know, Harv has a tendency, a San Antonio 7, Harper's Ferry 13. He always likes to, like, give a little number um, and then the t- title with that. And so we went to Harper's Ferry, and what we did there was, one, we shared our stories, and we shared what we valued and from our stories and from what we valued, we formed the identity of the DC Chi Alpha team. Uh, one of the things that we all valued a lot was coffee. And so can I tell you what we had at every one of our gatherings? It was coffee. Um, but we had an opportunity to form that identity together. And so we didn't have one person up in front saying, hey, these are the things that the DC Chi Alpha team will value. One of the things that we're in the process on enrichment as we form that that identity as a multi-site team and say, hey, what are the things that we are going to value together? Because if each one of us takes on that ownership, then that value is not just going to be something that's on the wall. It's going to be something that's expressed in everything we do. And so we spend time sharing our stories. We spend time developing our values. We spend time praying together. I think a lot of times for us, those of us who are task oriented, staff retreat, what is that time? It's time to plan it out. All right, guys, what's the sermon series? Hey, what are the events we're going to do? How are we going to do the outreaches? Who's going to do the fundraising? And we skip that time just to know what God is doing in our lives. How can we pray for each other? How can we grow together? And so I want to encourage you, those times we spend apart from the grind of ministry is essential in developing relationships. Another way that we um, grow as a team is through and and commit to relationships is through uh, shared projects. Listen, a team doesn't function as a team unless you're doing something together. You know, I think a lot of times we're like, hey, we're a team because we're in the same region. It doesn't work that way. Hey, we're a team because we all call ourselves Chi Alpha. But if you're not doing anything together, you're not a team. You're not a team at all. And so you need to do something together. Can I tell you some great places where you can grow together, share projects as a team? Worship gatherings. One of the things that's been really uh, fun is um, at um, uh, in, in Richmond, we've seen our ministry grow from one campus at Virginia Commonwealth University. Now we are pioneering at Virginia Union University, historically black campus. Um, and so um, we had been meeting on campus at VCU. Um, for the first couple of years, but all of the classroom buildings basically got shut down to us. And so thankfully, we've got a great partnership with a local church about 10 minutes away from campus. And so we've been able to meet together in a worship service on a Wednesday night. And as we started developing at uh, Virginia Union, we've invited them into those worship gatherings. And can I tell you, it has taken on a citywide feel. And so as that beginning, that small campus starts to kind of of grow, we're able to invite them into something much larger uh, than just kind of like small, you know, I remember my first uh, large group meeting at American University, we said, hey, we need to start small groups. And then they're like, hey, we we are a small group. Uh, No, we had the opportunity to invite them in and it it takes on an entirely different flavor. Citywide retreats are another way that you can kind of grow that um, team project together. Hey, um, how many of you guys like to do fundraising? Nobody does. Man, isn't it great to be able to share that burden together? That's another great way of doing that. Leadership training. Um, One of the things that we find is this, is that each team member brings a unique gift mix to the table. And when we begin to share in a relationship, when we begin to understand how each person is wired and what they are passionate about, we can utilize them to grow that that citywide, that that multi-site team ministry together. There are some folks among you who love to do administration, and you're like, I hate administration. And man, hey, can you come around and show me how to make this happen? There's some of you who are like, I, 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 I tried the three chords for the Lord and I can't do it, you know, but you've got some folks who want to, we love leading worship, right? And you've got some uh, other folks who um, love to teach. They love to teach. You can invite them in and uh, be able to express that together. Another way that you build a team is by just, just meeting together and growing those 
opportunities you have to connect. And so um, we we meet together as a citywide staff every week. Todd's going to talk, talk a little bit more about what those staff meetings look like. But that's something that's just essential. We grow together in relationship when we spend time together. So there are so many other ways that we can grow together. But let me talk a little bit about some of these um, relational threats that we can find um, in uh, this multi-site team. One is this. It's, it's, it's just city life. It's city life. Now, some of you guys come from different contexts, but I remember when I first moved to Washington, D.C., someone said, take your to-do list and cut it in half. Uh, and then you'll be lucky if you get that done. And I'm like, you got it. You're out of your mind. That's no way that happened. And then I got in my car to go to the grocery store and realized that the two mile drive took 25 minutes. And I'm like, okay, I understand. It's a little bit different, right? Some of you guys are in other contexts. So now I live in the city of Richmond and, and I, and I chuckle when people are like, oh, Three o'clock, it's rush hour. It might be tough to get across town. I was like, you guys have no idea what we're talking about. Or they're like, oh, man, city parking in Richmond. I never go downtown anymore. I'm like, you've never seen Georgetown in the middle of rush hour, right? But, but um, one of the things that you do find is that as you get further apart, um, it becomes more and more difficult to prioritize that time together. And so just, just moving from one campus to two is just kind of an exponential challenge um, to relational life. Here's another uh, relational threat. Um, it's, it's competition. It's competition. Um, what Scott said I think is so important. When one of us wins, we all win. When I was wins, we all win. But here's the deal. Like, I don't know about you guys. I, I grew up with, with th- two brothers, right? Well, there are three of us. Um, I grew up with two brothers. And, man, everything was a competition. Like, <laughs> whoever got the most tater tots was the winner at dinner. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was all about competition. I think there's a lot of times when we, we struggle with that. Like, oh, man, I'm so thankful what's going on at such and such a campus over here. But, man, God, why isn't it happening here? Instead of celebrating, we become envious. And that competitive spirit causes our team uh, relationship to fracture. Uh, beware of that competition. Um, the other part, and I talked a little bit about this already, one of the things that can fracture a relationship is just ministry success. Ministry success. And so um, as the student ministry grows, we say, you know what? It's going to be more beneficial for me to spend that team time doing something over here. I can add more one-on-ones. I can add more of this. Um, and so that relationship begins to fracture just because of that success. And so that becomes that continued commitment to say, hey, we are in this together as a multi-site team. We are growing together. We are doing things together. We are committed to the growth of the entire team, not to just my own um, area, not just my own campus. So we become uh, committed to growing together. And then uh, another relational threat is this, the work of the enemy. Listen, the enemy knows how strategic our city campuses are. The enemy knows the global impact of your campus. And if we are not paying attention to the work of the enemy and calling that out, then he will easily fracture our team. And so I want to encourage you this. If there's only one thing you do together as a team, commit yourselves together to pray. Commit yourselves together to connect in the work of the Holy Spirit and believe for the empowerment because we cannot be successful as we extend ourselves without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit on our lives. So, man, there are so many more things that we could talk about here in this session, but I wanted to pass it on uh, to Todd as he talks, talking about some shared values. Thanks, Mike. Um, I want to briefly just walk through a couple of thoughts about shared values and and why that's important. And, um, okay, just hit the space button. Okay, cool. Um, Well, before we can talk about values, the first thing I want to talk about 
is having a clear and a unified mission. Um, and I'll talk about the relationship in a moment between our values and our missions. And again, a number of the things that we're going to share today, it overlaps to not just multi-campus, but team building in general. But we want to make it as specific as possible to multi-campus and to the city ministry urban outreach. And then we'll have some Q&A so you guys can kind of help us fill in the blanks to make sure we're really speaking to where each of you are. But when it comes to a clear and unified mission, let me say this. Your mission is your reason for existing. And we need to know why we are doing multi-site. You need to know why you are doing city outreach campus ministry. And I would say it helps for it to be articulated. Even if it's generally speaking, man, we are called to touch multiple campuses for the glory of God to see Chi Alpha's planted on multiple campuses in that particular context. Say that. Make it clear. I, don't, I won't say you need to write it down, but I think it would help for it to be written down. Because when you write it down, it, it brings more clarity. And if there's more clarity, there is less confusion. And that brings about greater unity. And I'll share with you guys our... Um, our mission in Chicago is building a citywide community of authentic student disciple makers. Every one of those words means something to each and every last one of us on the team. And we can talk more about that during Q&A if you have more questions about that. But that here, this is our reason for existing. Everybody on our team, even our students, many of them can quote that because we put it out there all the time. Because it's really the thing that guides us when it comes to the different things that we commit to doing as a ministry. So after you, if you will, have your clarity of mission or some sense of it, I would also encourage you to define your shared values. And we talk about the importance of shared values. I would say the relationship between your mission and your values. Your mission is your reason for existing and in other words, it's the why. Your values is who you are. Your values is the what. And they actually support and undergird whatever that mission is for you. And so I think it is vital, once again, that you take some time. Some of you are waiting to go to a multi-campus context. Maybe you're already doing a campus, but you want to expand it to two or three, and you have staffers coming in. And some of you, you've been doing it for a while. And maybe you don't have these things articulated. That is okay. Uh, it took us a while before we were able to come up with these different values in terms of articulating them. I'll also share ours with you guys as well as it pertains to our values. So our first one is um, student disciple makers. The next one is citywide community, diversity, spirit empowerment. There are six. Excellence in serving and team honor. Again, each of these means something to us. Each of these are unique to Chicago Chi Alpha. Now, what you would notice is you really can't find anything on here that's a great deviation from our values nationally, right? And so I, I, I say that because I want to encourage you because you can look at this list and you're like, I don't have a mission statement. I don't have a list of values. That's okay. I would say start somewhere. It was four years into our time in Chicago before we came up with any of this language. And it was at that point as our team began to grow that we realized that we need to articulate this. And so my point is, is that keep it simple, but make it clear. Make it clear. Come up with some values. These things help to guide our decisions. If something comes our way, a church wants to partner up with us or another campus ministry wants to partner up with us. Generally speaking, we're all in. But specifically speaking, we go to our value list if there is a gray area and we're like, man, does this line up with our value? Does this help us with our mission? And this is why it is important when you're doing multi-site and especially if you're in a city, the thing you're going to battle a lot is the spirit of distraction over committing a lot of things coming your way a lot of ministry stimuli so what's the criteria what metric do you use i would say it should be your mission and it should be your different values and so with these different values there are a couple that stand out now again 
This is Chicago Chi Alpha. Um, this is our specific language that really, again, echoes what we believe as a movement. But we wanted to get things that were unique to us. So I'm saying that to say you don't have to have this list, obviously. But there are two on that list that I want to strongly encourage you guys to imbibe. If you are looking at doing multi-site and you're looking at having um, an outreach to um, an urban center, there are two things I want to quickly touch on when it comes to values. The first one is citywide community. Citywide community in a multi-campus or city context, you are working against what I would call the gravitational pull of multiple agendas. Even if you're in one campus, like I came from Carbondale and we had one campus, Southern Illinois University, and God was doing a phenomenal thing. But even on that campus and on that staff and on that team, when you have multiple staffers, guess what you have? Multiple agendas. That's a, that's a fact. Don't deny it. It's true. We all have different agendas. It is natural. And so that's going to, as Mike said, it's going to become exponentially an issue when you're talking about not just multiple staff, but multiple staffers on multiple campuses. And if you're in a city, you're talking about multiple neighborhoods as well. And there, there's a different dynamic there as well. But then you have students. For instance, we have students from Northwestern. They operate on a different wavelength, and they have different things that influence their decision-making, how they approach God, et cetera, than our students at Columbia College who are art uh, majors, and it's more of an artsy school. And then you have a school like Loyola, which is a Jesuit school. They're really big into social activism. So you're talking a lot of different agendas that come into play. And the more time you spend on one campus, the more you are going to become one with that campus. That's a beautiful thing. However, I think that citywide community as a value is critical to make sure that the campus doesn't come before the city or the team. And I want to really try to make that as clear as possible in these next few moments. But one thing we say when it comes to citywide community it's my city before it's my campus. And what I mean by that is this. We have a staff of 10, right? And of that staff, every one of them, that, that staff of 10, it's a citywide team. And I tell my guy at Northwestern that Northwestern is where you've been deployed, but Chicago is the city that you're called to, Chicago XA. And that's the case for our entire team. When I'm talking to people who might be considering joining our team, I'm not asking, do you want to go to a campus? I'm asking, do you want to touch a city? We see the city as a campus. That's how we, that's how we see it. And so the reason being is that if you're on a team, we're all on the same bus together, right? And we're going somewhere. But at any given moment, at times, the seats might change on that bus. And it helps to, for people to understand, staffers, and it trickles down to the students, that we're part of something that's bigger than us. And this is so important because when you have multiple agendas from staffers and students and neighborhoods and schools and different towns at times, what you're going to run into is there will be people vying for, if you will, credit, or people vying to overcommit to one school and, and undercommit to the vision at large for the city. And I'll just read straight from my notes here real quick. This value of citywide community, it starts with the staff and it trickles down to the student community. Opportunities for students from various campuses to cross-pollinate is crucial. And this value is vital because otherwise, what you simply have, you have multiple chi, alphas, multiple chi alphas in close proximity to one another. And so I want to just speak to that. For those who are doing multi-site chi alpha, do not just have multiple chi alphas in close proximity to one another and call it multi-campus. I would say have a team that has a unified mission to touch that particular geographical area. Amen and then operate as a community, please. And we can touch on that some more with, um, during our Q&A time. The second value that I would love to, if, I, if you will, pass along to you is team honor. Team honor, once again, it, it goes hand in hand 
with citywide community. Team Honor just says that I'm part of something that's bigger than myself. And this helps to navigate um, our, our natural tendency toward selfishness and putting our agendas first. Attitudes that can easily crop up because there are different dynamics that you are dealing with when it comes to multi-site. Specifically when it pertains, as it pertains to um, doing it in a city urban setting. One thought that I would share when it comes to team honor is this, unlearned speed. Unlearned speed. And what I mean by that is this, you are moving from the typical five to 10 mile radius of campus missions life. I, I, I knew that for some years in Carbondale. It was beautiful that I can get up in the morning, get showered, read my word real fast, and jump over to the prayer meeting in five minutes, from what, walk out the door and be at the prayer meeting in five minutes. I kid you not. And this is not like next, I'm talking across town in five minutes. That's the reality for, I think, generally the majority of Chi Alphas. When we talk about the typical college town. Well, when you're doing multi-site, especially in an urban setting, you're moving from a five to 10 mile radius of campus missions life where you're able to do prayer meetings. You're able to do your worship gatherings. You're able to have fellowship. You're able to connect with the local church and go out to eat after the, uh, after leaving the local church, have your socials, etc. in that radius that Oh, thank you. Come on, Josh. You just fixed it for me. I guess I broke it by pushing the wrong button or something. Um, but let me just read this again. Um, you're moving from the typical five to 10 mile radius of campus life into, get this, a 30 to 40 mile radius of team membership. Now, I knew when we did this, I was talking to Mike about this, that when I share these stats about being in the city, and Mike talked about the we could talk Okay. If you're considering going to a city, either you're going to really be burdened by the need after you leave this place, or you're going to be scared out of your minds away from going to even try to explore this thing. Because it really is, it's a radical concept, and that's why it's not happening a lot. But we know that God is on the move, and that's why you guys are here. And so with that being said, this increased time that you commit to attending staff meetings, citywide socials, citywide worship gatherings, team church windows, etc. It can and most likely will mean a slower moving timetable for what you're building on any one campus. Does that make sense? My point is, is that the extra time, for instance, our staff meetings every single week, every Monday, we spend two hours together as a team having staff from 11 to one. That's just sitting down, having our staff meetings where we debrief, we encourage one another. We communicate about what's coming up when it comes to the calendar and we do training. We do that every single week like clockwork. Well, that's just sitting down, but we're not talking about our staff from St. Xavier up to the Loyola, which is from the far south to the far north side of the city, about an hour and five. I think it's not too bad. When it attending our citywide worship gathering um, on Fridays during rush hour, the traffic can make an hour and a half commute if you're lucky, if you're coming from Evanston, which is what Western is on the south of the city, or um, the St. Xavier area. You're doing citywide social. Doing these things, you're committing to things extra not spending on your local campus, most likely, because you can't be two places at once. And so it's going to slow down the timetable of the fruit you're hoping to be on your campus. And we encourage that. And he wants us to bear fruit. Hunter says that that we can go far. Tim Hunter says that I'm bigger than And we're able to go, we're able to bear longer, lasting, deeper in the long run. And so it's worth the sacrifice. Let me encourage you in that it is, it is vital that you, in my team 
honor. And I would say, depending on your context, even if it's just multi-site in a small town, it will slow things down. And that's not a bad thing. I would say unlearn speed because what you get as a team and you lose in short-term fruit, you're going to gain back in spades. Absolutely. It's the whole we are better together mentality. I'd also say this, put your values on display. If we're talking about community and we're talking about team honor. You can't just talk about it. Let's be about it. And that means intentional about living out your values. And Mike mentioned this a little bit. He talked about it. And I'll go down a quick list of how you can be intentional about living out your values. For us, and I won't take a lot of time, but we have citywide worship gathering. Every Friday, we have all of our five campuses gather at UIC. That's our hub. We have the hub and spoke model in the city. UIC, every Friday at 7 p.m., for students from different campuses come and we have a worship gathering. Showing, that's showing that this is the value of ours, citywide community. And that's a shared project of ours as well. So we're building relationship at the same time. We do it once a week. And that's not our long-term goal. By 2020, our goal is to have one worship gathering Fridays every single week, three times out of the month. And then once a month, we're going to come together as a citywide community. But currently, every week as a citywide community. I mean, so whether you do it weekly or monthly, or bi-monthly, once or twice per semester, I would say you should have it in your rhythms to gather together um, on, a, on occasion. And then citywide leader meetings, citywide leader retreats, we train our leaders together. And this overgirds what our um, different campus directors, our local campus directors are doing with, with their leaders. But we do this to make sure we have a common DNA, the consistency Scott was talking about last night. That is why we do citywide leader trainings and retreats, citywide socials. And this is something we do. We assist other staff and students with outreaches on their campus. When Andrew at Northwestern is needing help with transporting, because we hand out coffee every single week at Northwestern to the students there. When he needs some help, we have students, I'm, not, I'm sorry, yeah, sometimes students, but primarily our staff will come and we'll help him set up or we'll do whatever we can to lighten the load because we're not here to say, oh, that's his campus. No, it's our campus because it's our city. And so those are just some thoughts there about how you can put your values on display. All of that being said, I'll pass along to you as someone passed along to me. Be rigid with your values, but be flexible with your strategy and your structure. What I mean by that is your strategies, your structures, your goals, they have an expiration date, if you will. But your values, that's who you are. So don't violate that. But as your ministry goes from being an infant to being a, a adolescent, if you will, a teenager, to being being a parent, as your ministry organization begins to grow, you're going to have to change your strategy as you move on. flexible to that. And be sense and this helps us, this mentality, it helps us where we have our values, that's great, but it has we have a lot of space for our different campuses to have their unique ways of doing outreach, having socials, or nine at Northwestern. We put a lot of time as a staff into the Veritas outreach on campus because that's a big deal for that campus to be engaged intellectually. Guess what we don't do at Northwestern? And we don't encourage our staff to do. Have a concert, right, to draw people. But guess what? We don't do Veritas at Columbia College, but we do have concerts at Columbia College to draw people. We have something at UIC a bunch of where we get together and it's more of a social time that we have. We literally share lunch, we bring food for others to connect. It's something to supplement a small group that we have on a weekly basis. That didn't work at Loyola. Loyola students didn't have the same discretionary time that the UIC student had. And it just didn't, it just wasn't working. And so we had to be flexible with that. And if something's not working, change it. And God has something new for that particular one. But my point is, is that 
whether you're on a team or you're leading a team, be mindful to give space for people to be who they need to be to reach that particular camp. Amen. Okay. And then um, let me quickly hit you with how many of you, you don't have to raise your hands. I'll just say, I want to share these next five minutes for those who are team leaders uh, when it comes to a citywide team. And I'll say this, and then after I share a few thoughts, we'll open it up for some Q&A. But um, I'll say this. Unequivocally, I'm convinced that there has to be a team leader. And maybe you were part of something that was organic, and it was beautiful. It just kind of came to the surface like, wow, God's doing something there, and God's doing something here, and God's doing something here. We go out for coffee together. We trade stories. We're all out there. Let's do one type campus, and we'll have a leader by committee. No. There needs to be one team leader, and that's vital. We see it in the book of Acts where there was an organic outpouring of the Spirit, and the Spirit of God was moving. But it started organically, but God said, let's bring some organization. Set apart for me Paul and Barnabas, and set apart for me these different ones. Have somebody do waiting of tables while you guys do to minister the word. Why? Because you need organization as it grows so that the thing can expand. And that's why I think team leadership is vital. And I'll walk through this fairly quickly. First, the team leader must be the champion of these shared values. In other words, we can't just talk about shared values and just have them out there on a sheet of paper or in our hearts to speak. But who's modeling it? Who's going to shit? And how can a team leader, if you're a team leader, how can you be champion of those shared values. Number one, you should define what those values are. It is incumbent upon the team leader to define those shared values. And we can do it as a team as well. We came with the language as a team. We discussed it democratically, our different values. But then I made executive decisions. I came back to the team and said, man, and these are team members who weren't just there for a season. They're like, man, we're lifers in this. And I think it's important that as a team member, as a team leader, that the team members' voices count. In fact, sometimes I encourage pushback for our team. Like we have a team for a reason because I don't need a whole bunch of ties because we're not going anywhere with a bunch of ties. So you guys are bringing something unique, as Mike mentioned earlier. So I say, open your mouths and, and, and share your voice. With that being said, there are times that I have to make executive decisions. And so team member, I'm sorry, team leader should he has the, the last line of defense to define the values. He should teach the values. And we do that by having our staff meetings. And we incorporate our values in our devotionals. Or we will have a book that we'll read together. Um, I'll bring in some training to help teach and reinforce our values. Model it. Right? Amen? We should live it. And then finally, expect it. And that means, and this is where it's not comfortable Leading, and you guys get this because we're all here leaders in our own rights. We need to hold ourselves and our team members accountable to what our values are. And if we sense that when it comes to the, the amount of travel that you have to put in to come to a staff meeting, and you sense that one of the team members, their attitude isn't as kosher as the others, hey, you should be courageous enough to put to the side and say, is everything okay? And let's talk about that. This is one of our values. We signed up for this. Hey, how can I help you? Right? But we need to hold ourselves and each other accountable to whatever we say our values are. Because if they're truly our values, they will be tested. And we need to reinforce it through the teaching, the modeling, but also the accountability that we provide. And my next slide, I want to give two pieces of advice for any citywide or multi campus team leader. The first piece of advice would be maintain healthy relationships with multiple local churches. You need to be freed up. That's why it's a challenge, but most of us probably do it if you are part of a multi-site ministry. You're going to be committed boots on the ground to one or two campuses, and you may that might change from season to season as your staff grows or diminishes, right? But you need to be able to wear two hats. And I would say long-term, it should turn into one hat. And that's the hat of team leadership 
where you are helping to cultivate relationships with multiple local churches. How many of you come from a town where you have multiple, in your Chi Alpha context, rather, rather you have multiple uh, assembly of God churches that your students connect with? This is by showing of hands. See, that's that speaks right there. And that's why you're in this room, because you understand that not every student can attend the same um, church. And definitely not in Chicago, because you're not able to travel. You should not be traveling an hour and a half when you have a local church that you can be pouring into, et cetera. But it's our job as team leaders to maintain those healthy relationships, to be able to have a symbiotic relationship with the local church. And I can fill in some blanks during Q&A if you want to know what that looks like for us. But I think that's vital. And it's also vital to maintain a clear sense of the lay of the land. Have a clear sense of where your team is at emotionally, where the team is at financially with their budgets. Have a clear sense of where they are at relationally, as Mike was talking about. If you're sensing something is fractured, hey, pull them to the side. Hey, let's talk about that. Have a clear sense of where they're at in their marriages. Have a clear sense of what's happening on their campuses socio-politically. Hey, what's happening in this season right now? You know, when, when the, the shootings went down, um, not the shootings, but um, the killing of Mike Brown in Ferguson. And no matter how you feel about all of that, let me tell you, it impacts what we are doing on campus. And we need to be able to pull back and step off campus physically and also figuratively and be able to pull back and get some wisdom on how this is impacting the different students, the different campuses. And then see, Lord, give me wisdom on how I could respond in this time. Right. And be able to advise. And we'll talk about how we can help our different staffers when it comes to advising. But we need to have a clear sense of these things. This is so important so you can know how to resource your different staffers, etc. And so here's the portfolio that I think a team leader carries. Generally speaking, these are the five things they should recruit. The team leader needs to recruit, assimilate, place advise and resource. And let me make some sense of each of those quickly. Recruit. That's simply find some full timers and or, well, especially full timers, obviously, but also volunteers from the local church. Volunteers who are there in the city. I'll just speak from a city context who are there and they're looking for something to be a part of. It is vital that you put in time for that. And that's why it's important to have a good relationship with the local church. And if you have questions about volunteering, I would love to answer those during our breakout as well. I think volunteers are crucial if you use them right. I'll just say this. A volunteer is not someone who shows up when they can. A volunteer is not someone that just says, hey, I help out as much as I can when I can. So whatever I can give is a surplus. Mm -mm. I don't I don't believe that. I guess in a sense they are volunteering, but. I wouldn't count on it and I wouldn't make that part of my portfolio in terms of my team because if a faithful, available, teachable does not just apply to our students. And so especially the availability side of things when it comes to volunteers. But we need to recruit, assimilate. We need to assimilate new team members. Uh, we have Becky in the back. She's now with us coming from Texas. She's part of our Chicago team. And what can we do? We're doing our best to make her feel at home in Chicago because Chicago is a little different from College Park, Texas. Um, and um, and we'll talk about some rude awakening she's had, um, some, some orientations to the city life. We, we, we're not going to get into all of that. Um, but it's, it's important that the team leader champions that. And then... What's oh, thank you, Becky. Appreciate that. You came here just for that one line right there. Appreciate it. And then healthy on ramps. Provide healthy on ramps. Make it clear how a person can get on board, and when they get on board, what that is going to look like. And then here's something I think that is. I'm sorry. Let me go. How do I go back on this, Mike? The arrow this way. Okay. And then like, okay, beautiful. Um, and so place. <laughs> this is something that is not um, something that happened a lot, apparently, in the old school. It certainly wasn't really how um, it was when I first came to Chicago, but I think it's trending this way. And what I mean is this. Generally, in the past, we talked about this, what would happen, and I'll wrap this up real quick. A person gets a call from God, and God speaks to them in a quiet place. He says, I'm sending you. 
and you're like, okay, it's time to go. They do their internship or whatever it might be, or they go to that foreign land of whatever the campus area is, and they say, this is the campus I'm going to. And then they tell the national office, then they tell the area director, and they tell the state director, this is my campus. I get the sense that that's not the healthiest way to go about it. And I think when it comes to multi-site, and this might be controversial, but I, I really believe in my heart, if you're going to be a team leader, part of your job is placement. Part of your job is saying, hey, again, I'm not calling you. God is not right now calling you to a campus. He's calling you to a team. And I have a decent sense by God's grace of the lay of the land. And I think with your skill set and the way that you're wired and our needs right now, this particular campus is where you need to be. And that's a lot to ask, especially someone who's uprooting with a family. And they're coming and they're going by faith in your leadership that you're going to place them in the right context. That's why as a leader, you have to be faithful to understand the lay of the land and be wise and get counsel on where you can place people. But that goes all the way down to strategic placement on campus and also living close to campus and even being courageous enough to say, hey, it's going to cost a little more, but raise a higher budget so you can live close to campus, right? Um, and then um, advise. That just means that we need to give some wisdom to those who are on our team, on the local campuses, to be able to give them wisdom on how to execute their particular mission on their campus. And there was one last one that I missed, and that was resource. You need to be a fundraiser. And that's why it's good to have a good relationship with the local churches so that you can go in and say, hey, we have fall kickoff. Right now, we're raising $3,000 for our fall kickoff. 500 for each campus plus 500 additional on top of that to help out with some citywide outreaches that we're doing. And you guys know that sounds like a lot, but that's really, that's kind of a drop in the bucket. But nonetheless, we're going to churches, knocking on doors, but I'm able to go with some credibility as a team leader saying, hey, I need this for our campus um, leaders. And so, but that's a big part of resourcing them, not just financially, but even with people as well. And so um, now I can hit that button. Great. That's, that's it. That's all we have. Okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, I hope that wasn't too much too fast and hopefully it landed with you, but we want to take some time now. We have about a half an hour to be able to fill some questions. And so please um, ask away or debate or disagree with anything that we just said. That's fine as well. Oh, no questions? Well, that's the case. Oh, my brother right here. Yep. Seven campuses plus we sprawl in the Orange County is like <laughs> Yep. Mhm. Mm so, I don't know. Yeah. And yeah. Great question. And and I'll try to make it brief with my answer, but Brandon, you just asked I'm going to repeat it for the mic because it's been recorded. But essentially, you're asking about placement. How do we place? What is our kind of like reasoning and criteria behind why we place certain people on certain campuses? And we've done it differently in different seasons. When it comes to an MA, we've done it where an MA who would come on and we know they're there for two years. The first year we would have them spend, because I want them to understand the citywide context, spend um, a half semester on one campus and then a half semester on another campus, just serving, observing, and doing what they can to help the local person on that campus. And then the next semester do the same and cover our three or four campuses that year. And then from there, I would get a sense, and we're having a dialogue throughout the year on where the following year they can be at if you will, for the entire year for the rest of their term. Now, for a family that's coming, and I'm going to treat them differently because most likely they're going to come 
as a full-term, fully appointed lifer in Chicago XA. And so we're going to have a lot of those conversations leading up to it. And I'm going to ask them about their experience, obviously find out about their skill set, and we'll talk about our needs, but I'm also letting them know and making it clear you're part of a citywide team. So things could change, but they're committing to the city, if you will. And so I'll let Mike jump in. Yeah, no, I'd love to speak to that um, just because we've seen uh, uh, sometimes go really well, other times go really bad. Uh, and I'd say the way it went really well is when we all came together and we said we, we had this idea that we were all going to be a team of directors. Now, there was an emerging leader. I mean, Harvey Herman was leading our team, so none of us were like, <laughs> we were all convinced, okay, he's the guy who wrote the book, so you're the leader. Uh, but we came together, and um, we recognized that we were doing something special at a significant time. Um, and so as we gathered together, we all went to separate campuses, but we would come back together as team. We met together on a regular basis, uh, and that went really, really well. Um, where it didn't go well is when we had um, other staff members who were used to a single campus ministry model, and they came into the team without fully being assimilated into the understanding of what it means to be a multi-site team, get on the ground and start running. Uh, because it was always defaulting to my campus. My kids is better for my campus. This is better for my campus. And so there was a lack of relationship. And so then, you know, just essentially a lack of trust. And they said, I know how to do it a little bit better. And so one of the things I just realized is that, again, geography does not make a team. Just because they happen to be two miles down the road doesn't mean that we're in this together. And so what I would say is this, is that um, uh, when you're inviting, some, when you're growing someone up in your team and they know you and they love you and then they would fight for you, that is somebody that I would say is easy to release to that next campus because, man, that's a brother, that's a sister um, and they're family. When you're inviting someone in, it takes a while for them to become a family member. Uh, because not only do we share that core DNA as Chi Alpha, but we also have to share that core DNA of those values that, that Todd was talking about. And so I think it's a little bit uh, longer to develop that. So, but Let me also say if indeed you have uh, people on the team who've been there for a while and now the campuses are opening up, but you have people who are already in, there's a relationship. So I think it's definitely always in play to ask, hey, what campus do you especially feel drawn to? And then kind of take it from there. You know, the luxury to have when you don't have the, the best ones are from within. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. I think we had one over. Well, for us, this goes back to the bonehead mistake of going without a team. The ministry, the campuses were outgrowing our staff. And so we're at a place now where we're trying to catch up to the campuses where we have a fingerprint already, five of them. And so um, we've had people ask, do you have anything at of Chicago or at I these different campuses in Chicago? I'm like, we're landlocked. We're to mandate with moratorium on us trying to do anything new. Let's first get these five healthy. So when it comes to expanding um, I'll say, Robbie, check back in, in about three years. <laughs> Let me talk about that. But I think really it comes to sensing out the door. DePaul, for instance, was a campus that we were knocking on the door, virtually kicking the door down, meeting up with the administrators. We had a handful of students. It became obvious after about six to eight months that this was not a door that God was opening. And so I would say be sensitive to that, um, the need, but also the openness on campus. And the good swell of students and churches that are local behind making that campus happen, then maybe God is saying, this is what I'm focusing um, next. I want to focus on expansion.
and I think that is a good comes back to that shared values that you're talking about. As you've defined those shared values, you keep going. Hey, how are we continuing to be in this together? There are going to be some unique things, kind of like what you know, they're going to be more effective one place. Uh, but that those shared values are one. One of the other things I think is um, key about this as well, organically, there's that trust that comes and that div- where you can start, I'm going to schedule this event that works best for me on Tuesday when our our, our multi our, our citywide staff meeting is supposed to be. I'm sorry, guys, that works better for me. No, there's trust there. You're like, hey, it might be a good time, but you know we've already agreed that this is going to be the place where we gather together. Does that make sense? And so, that's right. Sure. So as a good question. Um, so in D.C., we did. We had a different leadership team on each one, and we approached our campuses very um, um, singularly in that focus, came together as a team um, to gather for shared projects, citywide gatherings, things of that sort. Uh, in, in Richmond, we don't. Um, and I'm not sure when we will have it. It may come to to be a point where that will happen, but right now we are developing a young staff team, and they're growing their understanding of what it means to be in that uh, campus-wide leadership, and so we gather together and we grow together and to form that identity, and so one of the parts, it's actually really fun, when we talk about two different campuses, there are not campuses that are diametrically different than Virginia Union was a historically black campus uh, formed in 1865 to train African-American pastors for, and Virginia Commonwealth University. I mean, they're diametrically opposed to each other in just the way they're organized. Everything, like, I have no idea. But as we learn and grow together, it, it's been awesome. And the other thing that I think is really interesting is that um, students appreciate each other and the dynamic they have with one another. And so even though they look at things so drastically differently, they're like, hey, I know that I don't have a ton of Christian friends on my campus. And if I gather together, you may see this so differently, but at least we share Jesus together. It can be such an encouragement. And so um, we've just found that that is really super beneficial um, and it's just really helped us grow as a ministry. Great, great question. Um, so I would say that I think that it's prudent for long-term health and success that every campus has a team intact on that particular campus. And so um, we are just to see that become reality for us. Long-term, that is our heart, is that decentralizing the whole of how we operate week in and week out, but not centralizing again our values, our citywide mission. So for, let's say you are the lead director at Loyola, Chicago, um, you've gone through the internship. There is the call of your life to be a number one director. You're nationally appointed. We want to honor that call on your life and release you. And so what I tell our leaders, I say their autonomy with accountability, right? Um, because it's about trust. And, and even whatever delegated authority I have, um, there's nothing on the books that says there's a citywide director, if you will, you know, but it's trust. They're going to follow with me and they understand my heart. But again, structurally, long-term, I think it's vital that the, we have one person um, who's able to direct the campus, who could cast vision for the campus, who could understand the lay of the land for that particular campus, be able to um, grow in developing leaders, casting vision, etc. And the role of the citywide um, campus leader, team leader, is to advise and resource and to help that person stay healthy, keep moments in their lives, marriage, marital, etc. And so at the same time, I, I do think long term, short term or whatever, you need to have shared projects. You need to do it together as a city because otherwise you're going to default over time to just having separate chi alphas in a proximity to one another. Um, and then my brother right there. Yep. 
Yeah. Exactly. Uh, we have two levels of volunteering. One is the classic volunteer. The classic volunteer, we ask them to give us about 20 hours a week, three days a week on campus. They would commit to one campus where they're going to at least lead a small group. Um, at least, and also do one-on-one -on -one meetings with students on those different days. Um, because we see it as the whole volunteer deal, we think long-term, if you're able to learn what this whole missions thing is about, um, you're not going to learn that by coming one day a week for two hours. Um, and so we want them to be entrenched in what we do. So we ask that of the classic volunteer to also attend our weekly gatherings um, and also to attend our different um conferences and retreats, affiliate as a volunteer nationally. We want it to be a really uh, robust experience for the volunteer. We tell them straight up, this is what we are asking. If you can't give that because of all these other commitments that you're committed to, um, maybe they could do the second type of volunteering, which we call a specialist. That person can come once a day, I mean, sorry, once a week, um, and help out with um, projection or setup or something like that. Or we, we do food three times a, a month um, after our services. So they can, we had somebody who was our fellowship um, person this past year, did a phenomenal job, but that's all that she did, but she did a great job. So we, we kind of have it, our, our first ask is I, and if they can't, then we ask them to do the second. But even with that, we still ask you to attend our retreats and things like that. I don't ask our volunteers to come to our um, staff meetings. I don't. Uh, because when we have it 11 to 1, they're working most of the time. And so um, we do have them come to our leader training that we're going to have on 9th through 11th because we want them to be get to get the same training that everyone else gets. Uh, I'm not sure how Mike, how you guys tackle that. Um, we've seen different types of volunteers. We do have um, uh, plenty of spaces for volunteers who can help us execute um, different aspects of events. So, for instance, it's very rare we get somebody who's very competent on a soundboard. Um, and you know what? There are lots of churches that can help us out in that department. And so those are easy asks. Hey, can you help with that? Can you help with the AV side of things? And a lot of folks, we actually have uh, husbands of our staff members who come in to do that for us. It's fantastic. Sometimes you have a citywide worship gathering. There's no drummer in the house. You know what? Having somebody to come and be a part of that is fantastic to be able to do that as you raise up student worship team members. We have other folks, though, who have graduated from um, Chi Alpha groups. They are alum, and they know what it is to do Chi Alpha. And so um, one of our most basic volunteers helped me to understand what volunteers could do was a nurse named Logan Oiler. And she walked up to me, she's like, um, uh, it's the, the most meek voice. I can't even like do it. It was just like, uh, I'm wondering that maybe I could, I could help you out. I, I graduated from UVA Chi Alpha and, and I, you know, I, I've done some things I get help on campus sometime. And listen, if I had a dollar for every time somebody would tell me that I, I wouldn't have to raise my budget anymore. Right. I was like, okay, well, great. Well, why don't we meet sometime? We'll grab some coffee and we can hear what you, you, you're talking about. So she was a nurse and she worked three 12 hour shifts. And so I would say that the majority of the rest of her free time, she devoted to volunteering with Chi Alpha. I mean, she loved it. She was passionate for it. We were able to release her now. Now, she didn't lead a small group, uh, but she did train our um, uh, women's small group leaders. And one of the things, it was during a time where my wife was chasing around three toddlers. Um, and it, it produced a, a, a generation of women leaders on our campus. Um, and so I think it really depends on what you're talking about. I think it takes a while for a church volunteer to understand what we're doing. And it could potentially not rocket you forward, but actually set you back if you put somebody in that wrong place. And so if you're talking about somebody who's familiar with it, who spent time uh, in the trenches, um, you know, finding, fighting, you know, feeding, yeah, I mean, release them on campus to do that. Uh, but if somebody else, man, we've got tons of spots where we can kind of fill folks in uh, for volunteers, especially when we're talking about these citywide projects uh, to be able to do that. So, yeah, um, Matt. Uh, 
Absolutely. Yeah, we we have them come. We have a, a, a um, leaders retreat coming up August 9th through 11th. Um, they're required to be there. Um, and so because that's where we do the, the bulk of our training to get our students and our volunteers ready for the upcoming year. We also um, I do my best to try to meet up with them at least once a month. And when you talk about our staff and if I'm able to connect with our student leaders, um, that's me being generous to meet up with them once a month just to see if everything is making sense to them and how they're doing. And of course, we ask them to be proactive about reaching out. Um, but we, we are very serious about training. We also do a twice per semester citywide um, leaders meeting. Um, we do it twice per semester. Our this on Saturdays for two hours. Our volunteers come to that as well. And so we ask hi. And I would encourage everybody, when it comes to volunteering, ask hi, right? And if they can't do it, then that's okay. Um, move on. But what you don't want to do, and I've been burned by this before, and I probably will in, in the future as well because we, we see dimly, but we ask with, with wisdom and faith that they will volunteer. But if you ask someone and uh, – they, they, they're kind of wishy-washy, and like you said, it can be a setback because you're spending more time following up with them, reaching out to them. Um, but the Lord would make it really clear those whom he is calling to really get on board. And they vary in age and, and their background the whole nine. So, And I'll say this real quick before we ask, have one more question, or at least maybe two more questions. Is 3.30 the end time? Oh, well, I think our time is up. <laughs> That's good to ask. Talk, speaking of asking, but I'll say this: ask, have your volunteers be echoed, be a, a voice and an advocate for the to the local church on your behalf as well. Yeah. So, thank you guys um, for for and we. I'm here. I can hang out for a bit. I can walk with you to your next one as well if you would like. And, and Mike, I'm sure he'll make himself available. Uh, let me just pray a blessing over you, God. We ask you to touch every campus represented here. We ask you to really feel these urban centers with missionaries who want to go to the most strategic of the most strategic mission field that there is, God. So, Lord, bless them. Bless the next um, breakout session as well, Lord. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.